Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Happy Hour Live, the weekly webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Back inside this week. It is a uh, beautiful day outside, but uh, far too windy to be out on the uh, front porch doing the show today. But uh, we're back doing another one of our Writers Roundtable sessions this time around, and uh, it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Let's bring in our panelists now just to uh, start to have a little bit of fun here. Upper right of the screen, Moa Nilsson, the Swedish whiskey girl, joining us now from her place in Edinburgh. Lower right corner, Rosalind Durskin, the food and drinks writer for The Scotsman. And in the lower left corner, our pal Kurt Maitland on the streets in New York City tonight. Uh, Kurt, tell us where you are since I can see flags and stuff behind you. I am right next to the Javits Center of all places. Um, you know, seeing all the new construction that I've missed after being locked down in quarantine. What are you doing next to the Javits Center? I thought that was still shut down for uh, COVID vaccines and stuff like that. It Well, it is, but that's why I'm outside. <laughs> I uh, okay. happened to get caught in between uh, travel and rain. So I was like, well, I have to get on and I, wanted, I didn't want to miss happy hour. So I figured I'd, I'd catch it where I could. Well, Kurt, we've got your brand new book, The Infused Cocktail Handbook, and I've been reading through this thing, and it's uh, perfect timing because uh, somebody, um, one of these uh, barbecue-type smoking people bands, sent me one of these cocktail smoker things. Very nice. With, with the wood pellets and fire. You Not know, a good it, combination around the weather. here. Well, Pardon? you know, you could do it on your porch soon enough. Once the weather holds out, you'll be set to use it. And you, know, you can sit outside and do something. Give me some of the idea of some of the benefits of some of these, of doing smoking cocktails with these things. I know you've got some of them infused in the book, uh, smoke infused as well as uh, other infusions, right? Yep. Well, I'd say the benefits are, it's like you can make uh, the cocktail more unique. You can do something that, like you can take a recipe you like, and then you can modify it. You can um, improve upon it. You can make it a little bit better. And that's the fun part of infusion. So take any cocktail recipe you happen to have, and maybe you break out your smoker, or maybe you find some way to infuse one of the uh, one of the spirits that you're using for your drink to uh, make an entirely different cocktail, something unique for you and your guests. So you could actually make vodka taste good with this thing, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, in, in my first book, I, I called vodka the tofu of spirits. And that's not necessarily meant to be an insult. It's just a matter that it tastes like whatever you put it with. That's the reason why there are so many cocktails that are simply a fruit juice of some sort with a vodka. You know, you can't necessarily do that with whiskey, but you can definitely do that with vodka. And it's a good time to start talking about cocktails again, Rosalind, because we're starting to see bars open up and uh, the hospitality industry opened back up in Scotland this week, right? Yeah, finally. It's been a long winter. <laughs> yeah, so we our pubs opened um, on Monday the 26th and it's um, alcohol only outside, uh, which is you think would be fine given the fact it's late April, but it's it's pretty cold. It's not as warm as it was this time last year. Um, you can you can go inside for a meal, but you can't have alcohol. So there's been a lot of people in the rain, in their jumpers, uh, drinking pints. <laughs> well, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it is Scotland, and uh, if you're going to drink any, if you're going to be outside, I mean, it's going to rain anyway, so you might as well just sit outside and enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. You know, makes me make the most of it, and it's been it's been a long time. People have missed it, and it's it's, uh, it's yeah, it's just the spirit of just getting on with it and being quite hardy and, and not letting it stop you. Moa, how are things in Edinburgh right now, where you're based? Yeah, it's uh, cold, <laughs> but it's good. It's been one of those treacherous days. We've been outside with friends because um, we have some friends that are very keen on getting back, just being outside and meeting up. 
Um, but it's one of those days where the sun has been shining all day long, but the wind has been so cold. So we've all been kind of sitting there until we kind of feel like we have to go inside. But it's it's lovely to see people again and see that everyone's so keen to get out and also support all the businesses. But yeah, we just need a little bit of a warmer wind here in Edinburgh. <laughs> So what do you have in your glass, Moa, tonight? I know Kurt can't have anything since he's on the sidewalk, and the New York police do frown on that sort of thing. Yeah, even, even these days, yes. Yeah. What have you got, Moa? Well, I have a, a finishing a little sample that I have from High Coast Distillery in Sweden because it, I told you before that it's a little Swedish celebration evening of Walpurgis Night, I think it's called in uh, English. So I thought something Swedish would be suiting and it's um, the High Coast Solera. So they've done their own kind of Solera system with Swedish oak um, amongst other things. And it's, yeah, really lovely. They're making some good stuff at High Coast, uh, formerly known as Box Distillery, but uh, they changed the name about a year and a half ago because of some concerns from a, a certain company in Glasgow and Edinburgh, or near outside of London, that in the London suburbs with a uh, similar name. But uh, Rosalind, do you have anything in your glass besides water tonight? <laughs> yeah, I've got um, the Glen Scotia Campbelltown Malts Festival for um, this year, the 2021. It's behind me, but you might not be able to see it very well. Um, yeah, so it's a Bordeaux red wine finish, and it is very nice. But quite strong, but it's nice, opens up a lot of water. So I'm jealous because I mentioned that on the show this week, and I know it's not going to get over here. So I'm I'm curious to find out, tell, find out what you think of that one, because... Uh, <laughs> It seems uh, they're making some good stuff in uh, Campbellton, too, at Glen Scotia, and it's very underrated because uh, I know when people think of Campbellton, they think of Springbank primarily these days. Yeah, it's um, it's really good, and it's only £50, which I thought was, was quite reasonable, given the fact it's a festival release, you know, how they can go a bit crazy. Um, no, I, I like it. It's it's um, quite spicy. It's You can tell it's... 10 years old, but not in a bad way. It opens up the water and um, yeah, I've been drinking it quite a, a few times over the past couple of weeks. So, yeah. And uh, David Sturk just tweeted out, Kurt! <laughs> <laughs> We've known David yeah. for a long time. And yeah, so, no, Kurt, what I'm would you be drinking if you could right now? I'm sorry, go ahead, Kurt, what'd you say? Oh, I was saying, I, I miss seeing David. I miss being in Scotland. I would normally see David at least once a year because I'd see him at the old and rare or I'd see him at the whiskey show. And yeah, if I could be drinking anything right now, now that I see uh, Dave, I'd get one of his old exclusive malts. Um, I have a couple of those back in the house and I still love those. And I know David sold that uh, brand a couple of years ago and I, I miss it because uh, he always managed to come up with some really good selections for that range. Yeah. He had a great, you know, eye, nose, uh, palate for picking uh, whiskeys. I'm kind of sorry he decided to sell it because I kind of appreciated what he picked. And we are getting some folks talking about, uh, they've joined us now from uh, the Our Whiskey Festival and the uh, Spirit of Speyside events that are virtual tonight uh, and last night. Now, Rosalind, I know you were just watching some of the Spirit of Speyside stuff, right? Yeah, um, so I've done I've done three events there tonight. I watched the events there tonight. We started off with um, Tom and Tell whiskey with donuts, which was brilliant. It was at five o'clock though, so that was the start of my dinner. <laughs> nice way to start the, the weekend. Um, and then we um, watched the launch of Tam Do's Dalby Alley and their Spirit Space Aid, um expression that they're bringing out um, and I think that's actually sold out already which is great for them but um, they're, they're holding some back for the European market because obviously Brexit's causing lots of problems um, and then the end of tonight was that would I lie to you and they looked like they were having a great laugh uh, telling daft stories and deciding whether or not everyone was lying or telling the truth so it's been good. And you talked about these virtual festivals that are taking place uh, the Spirit of Space Side and uh, Becky Paskin's Our Whiskey Festival on your Scran podcast that just dropped today, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, we had, oh, I had um, uh, James Campbell uh, from 
Spirit Speyside, um, Becky and Blair Bowman from uh, the Founder of World Whiskey Day because they're all, Spirit Speyside obviously, is, everyone knows, has gone virtual for the first time. Um, Blair's World Whiskey Weekender starts over World Whiskey Day next month and Becky's obviously got our whiskey, um, a few events running over the course of a month, I think. And so caught up with them on the podcast, had a bit of a chat about the, what people can expect, but also we talked whiskey, whiskey tasting, debunking some whiskey myths um a bit of a it's, it's a good chat it's, it's good it's quite accessible chat for people who maybe don't know a lot about whiskey or have some questions that they've always kind of wondered um and it was great to to get them all together because obviously they all know each other and it was it was a really good chat it was, it was good it's out, it's out now if anyone wants to listen <laughs> let's talk about the uh the current state of things lockdown wise kurt is in new york city where things are starting to get back to normal and uh, the mayor has said he'd like to have things completely back to normal by july 1st uh, depending on what he and the governor can hammer out between them in new york we've we've already addressed the openings up in scotland what do you think is going to happen when we start opening the doors is it, is it just going to be a, a great big flood of people heading back out or do you think people are still going to be nervous about uh, going back out in public yet? I think in New York, um, people are kind of pent up. And the combination of having the outdoor and the indoor space will probably make people feel a bit safer as far as where they decide to be. You know, because the city is allowing people to, let's you know, say, allowing bars and restaurants to use the, the frontage in front of their uh, restaurants and uh, establishments. So that should give enough space between the accessible indoor space as well as the outdoor space to let people feel a bit safer. And also, you know, right now in New York, the um, vaccination rates are pretty high and the um, incidence of COVID have really dropped, you know, off the table. So I think people will at least you know, give it a try. I mean, keep in mind, you have people who like going to bars and like hanging with their friends and they've been stuck in their apartments for, you know, well over a year. And once the weather gets better, and especially if the bars are open and people are allowed to do stuff, they're going to take advantage of that if they can. Mo, what have you seen in Edinburgh? Uh, Graham Frazier in the UK says he had his first post-lockdown distillery visit to Glen Turrith this week. And uh, Spirit Bomb Tabitha down in Brighton er, in the London area said, uh, if anything is England is anything to go by, people are rushing to go out. What have you seen in Edinburgh? Well, to me, it seems a lot of people are very keen to get out there. And especially because it seems there's like all the businesses are taking their responsibility to make sure that there's social distancing and everything with the menus on the QR code. And when we went out, you can even pay through the QR code. So you don't actually have to have the contact with the staff in that way as well. So it's amongst the people that I've been meeting up with, it's either people are super keen to get out and just spend time with each other. And it seems that everyone who's managed to get the vaccination that really helps us to kind of a way to make everyone feel safer uh, but I also feel that maybe because I have some friends that are very um, introverted and I think they will struggle a lot with kind of going back to everything but then it is has been such a big change for everyone and just getting used to this that it's been our normal life the past year so it's definitely going to be different for everyone but I I think the general feeling that I have is that everyone's just keen to kind of get out there and start living a little bit more normally again. Roz, what are you hearing from within the industry? Because I know you cover food and drink Scotland wide. What are you hearing from um, the distilleries and from the, uh, the bars and restaurants? Uh, well, the distilleries, um, so some of them, as someone said, um, Glenn Turret, they, they've been there. That's, that's a whole other conversation because they've got a really nice restaurant opening that I would like to go and see myself. But um, the the distilleries are starting to kind of open. There's some some outdoor tastings. The shops are open. Um, some aren't opening yet just because they're too small. Generally, um, you know, Tom Kitchen, the chef in Edinburgh, he's been quite outspoken about how he feels about the restrictions inside. He doesn't understand why you can't have a glass of wine with your meal. Um, there was a lot of confusion over the the one meter separate households having one meter distancing within within restaurants. You know that was 
been disputed and talked about a couple of weeks ago. Nick Nairn was getting annoyed. He's he's a chef here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of frustration. They want to open up. They want people to come in and have their dinner and be able to have a drink. But we're only a couple of weeks away from that. And I, I don't think there'll be a reversal on that day. I think they'll, they'll go ahead uh, with the 17th of May. And that's another step towards normality. And I can understand the frustration. I just I feel like it's, it's difficult because you kind of have to balance it. And I, I don't think there's a, you know, I don't think there's like an ulterior motive in, in order for it to be happening. I think, you know, they're just trying to be very cautious so that we don't go back into another lockdown. But I can understand people's frustration because it's been a long, a long few months of no income. How, how has it been for you personally trying to cover food and drink? in lockdown when you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to bars, and you can't go see these people? Uh, it's been interesting. Um, I mean, I've been, from a news point of view, it's been amazing to see how people have adapted, you know, very quickly turning to takeaways, doing cocktail kits, doing, you know, meal kits. Um, but it's been it's been hard. I've spoken to a lot of people over Zoom, as everyone has done the podcast over Zoom. Um, but yeah, it's it's much nicer to be able to see and speak to people, and people are, people are so happy to get to be getting back open, and it's just it's nice to see that. But it's been a, a strange year. It's been watching things and hoping that there's still a fairly successful industry to come back to once we're all back out and about again. We are losing a number of bars and restaurants. Uh, have you seen any closings that are going to be permanent? I, I know Kurt talked in the uh, postscript for his new book about losing Norman's Kill in Brooklyn, which was really sad because I liked that place too. But we've lost a lot of bars. We've lost a lot of restaurants all over the world. Any landmarks in Scotland that we're not going to see once this thing ends? Um, yeah, so Castle Terrace uh, restaurant in Edinburgh, um, that closed quite, it feels like quite early on into last lockdown, although time right now for me doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, the Tower restaurant closed. There, there's been more more restaurants, I feel, in Edinburgh, like big names like that. So the, the guy behind um, Castle Terrace was a guy who worked quite closely with Tom Kitchen and you know, they're the big tourist hotspots that overlook the castle. You know, it was kind of a big name chef. Glasgow hasn't seen as many like that because it's not as reliant on tourism. Um, but I know that, you know, you speak to people and you just, there's a lot of people who said, you know, I'm basically hanging on by a thread. Like, we need to get this back up and running. Um, Mo, I don't know if you've got anything to add from the Edinburgh point of view, but it's, it's I feel like Edinburgh, and from a restaurant point of view, has been a bit harder hit than Glasgow. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. I've seen that there's some that are really, really struggling and it's almost like you're just waiting to hear what the when, if they're going to be able to stick to the schedule of reopening to see if they will be able to survive. So just really, really hoping that there's some of my favourite places that I'm just waiting to hear if they're going to be able to survive because it all depends on when they can open up again and how, how it's all going to work out. Yeah. Well, I'm just hoping that in Glasgow, the Bon Accord and the Pot still survive. They're fine. <laughs> because I'll be really sad if those guys go under. In Edinburgh, uh, I got to admit, I really like the bars at the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Uh, just because they've got a little bit of everything there. But I know there are so many good bars there. Kurt, what else besides Norman's Kill did we lose in New York that you know of? We lost Daddy-O. We lost um, Ward 3. Um, I mean, I was actually talking about this with the owners of the Brandy Library and um, the Flatiron that, you know, it's like what happened was the middle class of bars got hollowed out. Like, those guys are still up and running. They were always the big boys in the New York market. There are other bars um, that are, again, hanging on by a thread. But a lot of the middle of the bar market, people who were in Midtown and relied on, let's say, the tourist trade, whatever else, you know, they couldn't afford to pay rent and keep their doors open or, you know, pay rent, pay their employees and not have any income. So the weird thing is, is that right now, if you wanted to start a bar in New York, there's lots of opportunity because so many of these bars are closed. 
you could basically, you know, they're almost turnkey. You'd walk in, it's already set up as a bar. You might paint it or change the decor. But as part of your thing is that come summer and fall, a bunch of new people will hop into the market and kind of try to fill those spaces uh, for what we lost during the uh, pandemic. And I just, uh, I just hope that, uh, yeah, well, let me just, a couple of comments here. Tabitha Spirit Bomb hopes her favorite bar in the world, Bar Chef in Toronto, survives. God, I hope so, because Toronto and all of Ontario and most of Canada, as we uh, saw in a post earlier from Watchmen 999, um, Canada is still just completely shafted um, in terms of uh, the COVID response there. Um, Nick Kent counting the days until the whiskey jar in Manchester, England is allowed to open up again. Um, I think we all have these bars. We just really want to, uh, to be able to go back to, I know that uh, the Flatiron Room just had its first, uh, I think it was this week, uh, maybe even last night or the night before, had its first to a Whiskey 101 in-person class in more than a year now. Uh, question from Chris Ratcliffe for all three of you. What's going to happen to bar culture? Will there be new types of bars, uh, more eccentric or out there, people uh, that are willing to give things a try and shake things up in a vacuum? Uh, what do we think it's going to be like when we come back, or are they just going to do what they have to do to uh, keep the doors open and survive? I mean, I think on here, I think they're going to do with the combo. Like, you know, basically do things to get people in the door, make the best use of as much space as they have. So, like, do the indoor-outdoor, which they couldn't do pre-pandemic, but the city's letting them do now. Um, I think there might be some attempts, because the landlords really want tenants, to maybe move into some bigger spaces with, like, let's say, decks and roofs. So that way, kind of... Just in case something happens again, you have an uh, outdoor area you can rely on to kind of make use of in another, you know, partial lockdown. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be, you know, getting people back out is going to be one issue. Uh, having people be comfortable being back out, you know, is going to be something. I think in this, this summer, if the weather's good, you know, New York has a huge population enough to fill up the remaining bars. I mean, keep in mind, there are now less bars. So the bars that are left theoretically have, you know, more customers, more traffic as the other bars kind of, you know, establish themselves and to do what they need to do. So it could be very good if for the ones who were able to hold out for the bars that are starting up, they'll probably get a chance, but they have, you know, they have, they'll have certain opportunities but it could be kind of hard to, let's say, break into the market up against the established players. And I know with Ward 3, you mentioned a minute or two ago, they got hit with a double whammy because they were closed during a lot of 2019 because their building was being renovated. Yeah. And they just so they got a reopened just before the pandemic and then basically got closed right back down again. Exactly. You know, and it's hard because, you know, if, if you – it's one thing if you were a place that was a restaurant and you could maybe like ramp up your restaurant operations and sell food in the interim because, you know, people were still doing takeout. But if your main in main business was bar, if you're doing live entertainment, all of that stuff, you haven't seen a dime for over a year. Chris Ratcliffe uh, says he's opening a new bar in his office, the Go Away and Leave Me Alone. <laughs> I think that's a perfect idea, Chris. Uh, I want to let's change topics now and get to something happier. I want to find out how all three of you got into this business to begin with. And Mo, I want to start with you. How did you wind up moving from Stockholm or moving from Sweden to Edinburgh and then becoming the Swedish whiskey girl on Instagram? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I had when i went to scotland i did not like whiskey i had not really lots of interest for it uh, i moved to scotland because london was too expensive and i wanted to do a professional dance course and my dad said that scotland's nice so i found a really good course here and attended that for three years 
during my last year when I was getting ready to graduate and move back to Scandinavia, I met my boyfriend and he is Scottish, uh, born and raised in Edinburgh. And the day after we met, he started working in the whiskey industry at uh, the Scottish Whiskey Experience that you mentioned previously. And then when he was learning about whiskey, he brought home little samples and we kind of tried them together. And I already had an interest for wine and for flavors and how they kind of combine with culture. So when I started learning about whiskey and especially where the flavor came from and how like, all the stories behind it and how we kind of made people feel, uh, it really caught my interest. And especially when I tried a really lovely one that got really made me realize that I actually like whiskey, and that was Ardbeg 10. And after that, it, it just kind of <laughs> happened. We drank more whiskey together, explored flavor. I really like to be creative and to capture photos and text. So I started my Instagram uh, just as a way to kind of document my whiskey journey. And I thought about a name <laughs> for a really long time, and then, I just thought, let's keep it simple. I am Swedish, I like whiskey, and I'm a girl. So let's stick with Swedish whiskey girl. And yeah, I could have never really imagined it to kind of kick off, but here we are now. <laughs> and you have a following literally all over the world right now. And you may be one of the few people I know that started out with Ardbeg 10 and still drink whiskey. <laughs> because that's one of those whiskeys that uh, you give that to a lot of newcomers, they will never touch whiskey again. I think it might be a good one to give to Scandinavians because we really like this kind of smoky, meaty kind of, it just made me think of home. Uh, and especially nowadays, just having a sip of an art bag making me think of hikes up in the woods in Sweden. It's just such a lovely thing. <laughs> and uh, Chris Ratcliffe has a question for you, Moa. What is your approach for using Instagram? You post really frequently with both posts and stories. What's your approach for sharing both information and your views and enjoyment? Oh, interesting question. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's, well, I really enjoy it. I think it's fun to capture photos and to kind of find different angles and play around with lighting and also to see, just explore the flavors in the whiskey. And my whole approach has kind of became this way of making the whiskey industry a little bit more welcoming and friendly for everyone. So I'm trying to keep a little bit of a mixture of maybe educational, because I know some people that follow me might just have had one whiskey in their life and I know some people are super fans and have been to almost all the distilleries in Scotland or in Scandinavia or in um, the States of course so I try to mix it up and just to try and make it a little bit fun and not so difficult uh, if that makes sense so it's just a way of sharing my approach to whiskey sharing the new things I try and then if I have it with a cinnamon bun you're gonna get to see that if I have it in a highball you'll see that or if I just drink it neat I'll just let you know what I think of it and it seems people really appreciate that approach so that's what keeps me going this lovely interaction and finding the creativity in it very cool and I follow you on Instagram and I learn things from watching your your stories and watching your posts and uh, I've learned from you so thank you for doing that uh, thank you very much <laughs> Rosalind you have probably the job that every journalist in Scotland wants writing about food and especially drink for the Scotsman the uh, what bills itself as the national newspaper of Scotland how did you wind up working at the Scotsman and how did you get into the food and drink in the first place? Uh, it was quite a random journey because for years my, my career started in magazines and I always worked within interior magazines so it's completely random you know didn't, doesn't really tie up at all um, but I was I worked in Glasgow for moving to London I worked in London for a few years again in magazines and um, got an editor's job out in Dubai worked there for two and a half years and was looking to come back to Glasgow where I studied um, and a job was Contract, contract came up at the Scotsman and I went for it and got the job and um, I was brought in to help Sean Murphy who was the food and drink editor at the time um, because they wanted me to do more lifestyle work because you know magazines, interiors, that kind of thing um, and it kind of just grew from there. I worked with Sean for uh, three, three and a bit years and um, worked on the food and drink site with him um, he, his family um, have the pot still in Glasgow, so they're obviously big into whiskey. I was going to events with him and kind of 
I, I, I think I was I was asking my boyfriend this tonight as well because he really he's really into whiskey and I was like you know it's funny that we kind of came to whiskey at the, a similar time and we're trying to remember when it was and why but I think it was working with Sean and working at the Scotsman and, and getting to speak to distillers and get learn a bit more about it we went to Spirit Speyside um, and that's when I started trying lots of different um, Speyside whiskies because I'd really gotten into whiskey via the 21 year old Glengoyne, which is quite obviously quite expensive one. Um, so yeah, that's it kind of all happened just through um, work, I suppose. And yeah, it's, it's great, it's a great job and Sean's moved on now. So it's me, um, me and myself just kind of doing things uh, for that food and drink site with the Scotsman and just speaking to people all the time. It's such a passionate industry and, and everyone's so nice and it's very welcoming. And that's a, that's sort of similar in the interiors industry from when I worked in magazines. It's not snobbish or, you know, I've always, I've just felt people to be very welcoming and they always want to talk to you and there's great stories. And I think that's part of the, what I think is, you know, the people that are really into it are really into it because it's, there's always a story to tell and it's, you know, a great, great drink to have to, to sit down and talk to people with. And I've just, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a, a very interesting journey so far. Kurt, how about you? Um, I know you and I have not run into each other so many times over the years on the uh, tasting circuit in New York City, um, as well as running into each other at the Whiskey Show in London. How did you get your start? Mm. With me, uh, I mean, I got into whiskey because I didn't like beer, in all honesty. Uh, in college, I would have beer and, my, you know, it would kill my stomach. So a friend of mine, like one of my best friends at school, she was from Hong Kong and loved Jameson. So I drank Jameson throughout college, got into bourbon when I uh, got to B.C., and that's where I met uh, Rich Thomas from the Whiskey Reviewer. And so, you know, he and I worked together. He started the Whiskey Reviewer. He needed somebody in New York to do coverage. And I was his guy. He's like, oh, you can write, you know. And I'm like, okay, you know, whatever you say. So I started doing it that way. And so my progression was Irish to bourbon. And then when I got to New York, it got into scotch and Japanese and everything else. And so on top of that, because I mean, the thing is, is like I was a history major in college, so I love the history aspects of whiskey. So that's why I started the Whiskey Club. That's what I love about writing or like, doing events. And then somehow I fell into writing cocktail books because, you know, they asked me if I could do it. And I'm like, yeah, I could do it, you know, I think. And so I pulled it off. That's sort of like every actor. There's there. I heard somebody the other day when you're auditioning for a role, they say, well, can you fence? Yes, of course I can fence. Can you <laughs> swim in the ocean? Yes, of course I can swim in the ocean. Yes, I can speak with a French accent if I have to, of course. If, yeah. Just like when editor says, can you write a cocktail book? Better believe I can write a cocktail book. Exactly. Yeah. When they, when they actually asked me, it was funny because I'm like, my response was, well, I write about whiskey. They're like, yeah, we didn't ask if you write about whiskey. Can you write a cocktail book? And I waited for like a second. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess I'm arrogant enough to assume I can write anything given enough time. So if you give me enough time, I can do research. I can write whatever you want. So there we go. That is the secret to journalism. Always saying, <laughs> yes, I can learn that subject real quickly. Yeah. Learn just enough to be an expert in it for five minutes. And you got a breadth of experience that's about an inch deep in a lot exactly. of different things. Yeah, there you go. So where is whiskey writing and whiskey journalism headed? Uh, Roz, I'm going to start with you on this one because w you're one of the few people that still writes about food and drink for a mainstream newspaper still because uh, newspapers are dying off right and left right now and the whole industry is changing. Where are we headed with the whiskey writing as journalists? Uh, <laughs> I think, well, I mean, it's such a, it's, it's coming back, isn't it? I mean, whiskey, the amount of lost or, you know, ghost distilleries in Scotland that are reopening and the amount of, you know, the re reinvigoration of it is, is quite immense. And I think, you know, if there's that amount of interest, I feel like there will always be um, an appetite to read about it. So therefore to write about it from a journalism sense, 
you're right, like things are changing. My job is almost completely digital. Um, I think there is a place for long reads. I think there's a place for investigation. I think there's a, you know, there's an, there's an appetite for really in-depth things, which doesn't necessarily tie in with current business models for digital. Um, so I would like to see, you know, a bit, a bit more time and, and effort being put into things, you know, from publishers rather than, you know, targeted page views, <laughs> which a lot of things are. Um, but I, I think it's, it's not. It, the whiskey industry and the appetite for whiskey is growing and obviously journalism is changing and I think the two will combine and I think I think it's 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 just about how things diversify and, and how we move on and I think it's it's okay. I'm, I'm confident but I know what you're saying it's it's a very it's a strange industry and the last year has not helped anyone with advertising sales and there's so. a reason why I don't work in regular newsrooms anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just, wow. It's just not going to happen. It's, uh, you look at it and you go, no, this model is not sustainable. And I, la I haven't worked in a regular newsroom since the last recession. And I'm hoping to not ever have to again, but you never know. Uh, let's see here. We got a good question here that I think we got the question from Moa. But, uh, and... Let's see, as Graham Frazier points out, the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society Vaults in Leith is open for outdoor drinking in a marquee. Mo, I'm assuming you've been over there to check that out recently. Uh, is that the case? <laughs> I haven't been recently uh, because we only opened a few days ago, but I'll definitely go soon. Um, I used to go quite a lot, of course, when I worked there, but yeah, looking forward to go back soon. And uh, Rosalind, Chris wants to know, what sort of response do you get from readers with a broad spread of whiskey knowledge? Does a mainstream outlet like the Scotsman have a different focus than a, a specialty whiskey publication? Or do readers uh, just sort of follow the details and uh, understand what they don't know, so to speak? Yeah, so I think yeah, the latter. I think it's it's more of like a broad overview. It's it's more newsy. Um, I've tried to, with the podcast, maybe make on some levels make it a accessible and then other other levels take it a little bit more in depth but from the the paper and the web point of view it's very much a news and it's not it's not too in depth because it's not a specialist publication but we do um you know we're looking at, at kind of expanding that um and there is a you know we know the, the Scots we know their audience and there is there is a I think you know an area there where we could be going into more in depth, whether it's a one-off supplement or maybe we look further into the podcast. I, I don't know, but from a day-to-day -day basis, it's very much newsy and and sort of an overview of what's going on rather than anything specialist. And you have to cover the business side of things too. Yeah, to a certain degree, a lot of the, sometimes the business desks do pick that up, which helps me out. But yeah, there there is a degree of knowing what's going on business wise, who's bought who, who's left where, that kind of thing. Who's spending what on investments? I know uh, Ben Rayak just opened up a new visitor center this week. That supposedly they had never had one before, but they're opening up one. They decided to go ahead and revamp their entire visitor center during the pandemic, and I know some other folks did that as well. Yeah, it looks it looks nice, Ben Rayak. Um, yeah, I I never thought about it before because I'd visited there during Spirit of Speyside, but there wasn't really, you know, there was like a room where you would sit, um, and it looks nice. And yeah, um, you know, Johnny Walker Diageo was spending a lot of money revamping their different homes before um, the one in Edinburgh, uh, what was. Um, House of Fraser on Princess Street that should open at the end of the summer, which I think looks looks amazing. The rooftop bars look brilliant, um, and I think we'll see more of that across Princess Street. I think a lot of the department stores that are shut down will become bars with like views of the castle, which I think is going to be a really interesting use of that street. Because I mean, if you think about it, there was the Waldorf Hotel and not many other places where you could see the castle for fireworks. And if they, if they open up more venues like that, then it's just going to be brilliant when we can get back out in groups. <laughs> Have you gotten a sneak peek at that uh, Johnny Walker experience yet? I've only been sent artist impressions, but I think once they once they're ready to to go, we'll, we'll go around and have a look because we're, we're there's quite a few of us poised and ready to to run down. Well, I can't run down there, but a few people from Edinburgh are ready to go. Moa, have you uh, walked over and uh, 
tried to push aside the stuff on the covering the windows just to get a, a, a peek inside. Well, I mean, every time they open these little things that they have outside, I'm like, what, what's going on? But it's quite nice now. Can, you can start seeing the rooftop bar kind of taking place if you stand far enough away. So you can see it from a distance, the little chairs and everything. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for it. Oh, let's start some trouble right now because, uh, well, before that, um, the House of Frazier, which I think was one of those stores that's being converted, uh, Robin Cooper, our pal from Campari and Glenn Grant fame, his grandmother ran the cafe at the House of Frazier down on Princess Street in Edinburgh. Um, oh, as he well, wanted good to guy. share. Good guy. Um, Lord Crump, our uh, resident cynic and... Uh, poster of things that likes to start trouble. Uprox likes to post about whiskey, and it's obvious their writers have a very cursory knowledge. Is that, what's your pet peeve when it comes to whiskey writing in, in the media online? Uh, I've given up trying to correct some of these folks. When I see articles in some of these publications online, they just have more errors than facts correct. I've just given up on trying to help them. But how much misinformation is there out there about whiskey, and is it actually hurting us? I mean, there's a lot of misinformation. I mean, there's certainly there's sites we all rely on, like you know that sites that we go, I go on to do research on writing stuff. People I know to go to, but um, I'd say as far as stuff like Up Rocks or whoever else, the problem is, is that they come off as experts whereas they should say it's their opinion like i won't call myself an expert because i'm not i know some stuff i'm a fan i've done some research i've traveled but there are people who know way 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 more than me who are far more deserving of that title um and i think it's important to try to get it right like to just do some time doing some actual research if you're going to write something it's one thing if you're writing an opinion piece where you're like oh I drank something and I tasted it and I felt this way. Well, that's fine. That's your opinion. But if you're writing something which should be factual, based in fact, you're talking about, a, you know, what a distillery does or how they process something. It's like all that material is out there and easy to find. You should just make use of it and be as accurate as you possibly can be. Rosalind, Moa, any thoughts? I was going to agree with that. I think there's there's this kind of weird atmosphere with some texts and it's almost like everything's being presented as this is the absolute truth and i am correct and there's not even a will behind it to maybe have a discussion or to learn from it it's just like this is the way it is and you can't say anything about it which i feel is a bit of a it's a dangerous thing in itself because people then look at that and take it as facts, which means that when someone else who might be slightly more humble talks about it, they might be like, no, you're wrong, even though they haven't taken the time to actually look it up. And I just feel like overall, people just can be a little bit more check your facts and just be nicer to people in general and just, yeah, <laughs> I think that's why yeah, everybody makes there. mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Everybody makes mistakes and nobody's perfect. Um, and Kurt, I agree with you. I mean, I've been doing this for 16 years almost, and I will still, I will never call myself an expert because I'm still learning stuff every day. And having never made a drop of it, I couldn't call myself an expert on distilling, period, until you actually yeah. do it. Uh, Rosalind, any thoughts on that, on, uh, from, on, the, on the media part of it? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with um, what you guys have said. And I also think there shouldn't, no one should ever feel like they can't ask questions. Like, you know, I'm the same as you guys. I'm absolutely no way an expert and, you know, very much still learning on a lot of things. And I think you need to know who you can speak to, who you can, who you can trust, who, who you know is going to give you right answers to things, but also not be afraid to do that. If you need something and you're not quite sure and you can't find, you know, because there's a time element when it comes to all these for writing online, you know, you've got to have you know, you're acting and working quite fast, but you should be able to, and you are going to check things and speak to people and just get your head around what you understand and what you don't understand. So yeah, I, I agree with what, what's been said. Well, we have a good question here from Nurse Dave's Shaving World. And this is for both of you, Moa and Rosalind. 
the general, he's curious what the general opinion is in Scotland regarding bourbons and rice. And as you're answering this, I'm going to pour a little bit of Russell's Reserve 10 year old bourbon. So, uh, what is the general opinion in Scotland regarding these American whiskeys, besides the fact that the tariffs made them too expensive? <laughs> Well, I think uh, it's a really interesting one. And I saw someone else commenting about it earlier. And from my standpoint, I'm really fascinated by them because I don't know too much about them or I haven't tried that many. But I think that's simply because you can't get a hold of a lot of them and there's not a lot of information or education to be found here. You can find some in the supermarkets, but it's it just doesn't have the same presence as something like scotch of course but then if you have all the british uh, whiskies and then you have everything in europe so it's just a little bit more accessible so i think when you look on bourbons for example it's just one of those things so you like you know what a bourbon is but you i have the option of like do you want to go for a maker's mark or jack daniels and then i feel like you're missing out on a lot more of it uh, when it comes to rice, I would say rice nowadays isn't just exclusively an American thing here because it's more brands, for example, in Scandinavia and um, the Danish are doing it and across of Europe and of course now in Scotland as well. So rice more becoming just a grain type that you will see in whiskies. Of course, a lot of those brands will have taken inspiration from American brands, but it's so not something that is synonymous with America anymore. So it's it's a very interesting category, I think. And I love seeing it in Scandinavia because there's such a big cultural thing about rye breads, for example. So yeah, I think, I don't know what you think, Rosalind, if you see it any different. No, I agree. I think there is a, a lack of um, sort of knowledge around the whole thing, like mainstream. But I do think rye, especially is coming to the forefront. It's been talked about a lot more and there was the one down in was it Oxford that launched recently that sold out within like minutes. Um, you know, RBK have got their Highland Dry, they run to their, their second or third one. So it's I think there's like a sort of slow burn with rye. I think people are becoming more interested. Um, I know Becky or Whiskey is doing a rye, um, a rye one soon because I'm going to it and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a, a sort of no one people. If you're not if you're not really sure, you, or you're not really into it that much. You, you're not really going to know what to expect. Whereas with a whiskey, you know, you, you sort of there's a lot more knowledge out there, and it's a lot more wider known and available. So. I don't think it's. I don't think people are against it. I just don't think they're very sure. And with bourbon as well, it's like the mainstream ones you've heard of, and then, you know, that's that's kind of what's available. It's not. There's not a lot. It doesn't seem to, for me anyway. Rye almost and, seems uh, a bit trendy and hipster almost for me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens with it. And as Chris Ratcliffe points out, the English do rye now. Uh, Oxford Artisan Distillery just uh, released its first rye the other day. Yeah, lovely one. And uh, there is also, I mean, people keep forgetting that rye whiskey actually came from Europe because it was the colonial era settlers that brought rye to North America. And you're starting to see, and you still see rye in places like Scandinavia, Germany, you still see, and uh, Denmark, the Stowning folks are doing some great stuff with rise. So there is some great European rise. Uh, <clears throat> Chris Radcliffe points out the one benefit in Britain is it's easier to get Blantons. So, yeah, trying yeah, to get yeah. over here. <laughs> see, what we should and, do uh, is we should make we should make tasting like bourbon and rye tasting kits for our European friends. So whenever we go give them four or five minis of different bourbons than we get here that they wouldn't normally get in the store just so they can taste it, you know. Maybe that's uh, the way we can, we can help the education. And as Graham Frazier points out, uh, that boutique whiskey company from Master of Malt and Adam Brands, they've been pushing rye. They just sent out a whole uh, kit. I'm still going through a couple of them of uh, rye whiskeys, uh, those drinks by the dram things. So, and... Uh, as Robin Cooper, who would know this, points out, wild turkey uses German rye. And Robin would know, working for Camp Ari. So, and Nick Kent uh, tried that boutique company's, uh, the rye from uh, Belgrove rye this week. Mo, you and I were on that tasting. And I love Belgrove rye uh, from Australia, from Tasmania. Peter Bignell down there is uh, 
a mad scientist when it comes to whiskey and just does some really cool stuff. Uh, what do you think of those rice, to, of that one? Well, I didn't get that one, unfortunately. <laughs> that was one oh, of the two I didn't have. <laughs> but it sounded amazing. But the rest of that lineup was just incredible. Um, yeah, the, but yeah, Australian rye is on my to try list. <laughs> I am sorry. I, I knew they said there were some folks who didn't get everything. And I, I had hoped you had gotten that one. I should have asked you beforehand. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I had some others that were great. <laughs> yeah. The uh, How about the Kalara? Oh, uh, that was try? outstanding for me. It was... Yeah, incredible. Oh, yeah. Kirsty Lark Booth is doing some great stuff. I mean, she learned it. She learned from her dad, and I think she's even better at this than her dad was, Bill Lark. Uh, so what other let, – let's just sort of open this up now. What other world whiskeys have you guys tried that you are impressed with outside of the usual – the usual suspects here, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, the U.S., and Japan. What have you tried that's unusual that you like? Uh, some Paul John. Um, I've liked. I've got my hands on it. Um, you know, also, I've been kind of like Sleers in Bavaria. I kind of want to see where they go. I love the distillery. I mean, one, it's beautiful. You're sitting next to the Alps. But also, I just kind of want to see given more time where they take their whiskey. Rosalind? Uh, so last night through um, Spirit Space Side, we did the um, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society and chocolate pairing. And their last one was a, um, an Indian whiskey. And it was like, I think it was called like smoky sausages or sizzling. You know why they've got da daft names are funny. It's like the Faro and Ball of whiskey. Um, and it was brilliant. It was really nice. It was it was kind of like an Isla, it was quite smoky, but not too much. And I, I was very interested in that. And it was one of the f a few Indian whiskies I've tried. I got sent a whole load of um, like sort of mint sample bottles when um, Mike at the whiskey shop Dufton in October last year took his festival online. And as part of that tasting, he sent just some random samples. And there was a couple of Indian ones in there, but. That one last night from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society was really good. No? Well, it's so true. I find world whiskey is one of the categories I'm so, so fascinated about, and especially Europe at the moment. I had the pleasure of writing a piece on European whiskey for the website, The Whiskey Wash, the other month. And I just found so many countries. That I, like, I didn't even know they made whiskey, and now I have to try and source it. But I have to also mention uh, Taiwan. Cavalan, I think, is lovely. Uh, I have some Solace that I think are outstanding. I am also intrigued by Switzerland and most recently also Finland. Um, really a distillery called Valamo, uh, which was the last one I tried, thanks to um, a friend over there. And it's just, yeah, there's so many interesting things and I'm just so excited for it. <laughs> What's that distillery again? Because I, I knew Kuro... Yeah. Uh, near Helsinki, but I don't know that other one. What is it again? Valamo. It's uh, in an old monastery. And they also make mm. their own kind of, I think it's like berry wines they also make. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting one. I've got to find out about that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, and then Spirit Bomb and uh, Nick Kent both loved the uh, McMira Bjorksov. And Moa, I, just please correct me on the pronunciation because I know I probably <laughs> butchered that. No, that's right. Uh, yeah, so. York so? Okay, yeah. I got it right. Uh, so, uh, Graham Fraser has a good question. Can you see rye overtaking bourbon in the U.S. market in the future? No. They don't make enough of it. Not going to happen. Uh, rye, is, rye production is still, if anything, maybe 2% of bourbon production each year. Even with the demand for rye, it's, it's never going to overtake bourbon. Um, Let's see here. Uh, I really need to not post these comments from Crump. I've always wondered why I felt like invading Poland whenever I drank wild turkey. No. Um, and uh, yeah. Graham Fraser, given the Irish diaspora, I can really see Irish whiskey taking off around the world. Yeah. Uh, very. That's a good, really good point. What Irish whiskeys, if you try to know, Kurt, you said you started out with Irish whiskey. Yep, started out with uh, Jameson's, um, got the Peelings, I got the, or Teeling, I got to visit that distillery. I'm a big fan of Cooley, 
So um, I try to get like coolie releases or whatever comes out of that, that distillery because um, I know they say source or people source from them to do their releases. Or I go on the auction market because if I remember correctly, the Irish whiskey was not affected by the uh, tariffs. I think it was only it was it was single malt, but it wasn't Irish. So I think Irish and Japanese were exempt. So I got some no. stuff. Just a clarification, and that's been suspended, but it was single malts from Northern Ireland, which was basically the Bushmills single malts. Right. Okay. Anything else was okay. Okay. But uh, even Bushmill said they were basically eating the tariffs, essentially, and uh, so they were trying to keep their prices down. Um, whiskey Canuck, uh, the only Swiss whiskey he's tried was from Santis. Uh, didn't tickle his fancy, but it was some sort of beer barrel finish. Uh, you familiar with that one, Ma? Uh, I don't think I've tried anything from them. And now the name of the one I have tried has slipped my mind. But um, I, the one I have tried was a, that boutique whiskey company. So that was a particularly, really interesting. Is it Langatun, actually? I think it's called. Is that not a Swiss one? Uh, that I've tried that I was really impressed by. But I haven't tried anything from Sentis just yet. And uh, David Owen, MacMira Kungstorf is a good Swedish peated whiskey. Uh, MacMira does some really cool stuff with uh, because they not only they peat in an old container still, where they and uh, it's just it's uh, literally a shipping container that they turned into a peater, into a smoker for the smoking they're in. But they smoke it with juniper as well as peat. Yeah. Uh, and they mature whiskey 50 meters below the surface, which I think is quite cool. I'd love to go back and see those that warehouse. Oh, yeah. I love those caves. Uh, that, the, the cave there is, the, the mine there that they work, they work with is just uh, amazing. Um, Chris Ratcliffe, good question. For all of you, which distilleries would you like to visit that you haven't yet and the areas around those distilleries? I know you, nobody's visited any place in the last year, so... Uh, let me modify the question. Where do you want to go? What's the first distillery you want to go to when you get the chance now? I actually have something booked already. I uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be going to Isla um, in a few weeks. And that is definitely at the top of my list. And then just all the ones in Sweden as well as high up. But yeah, Isla, I just can't wait to go. Kurt? Bora, Bora slash Klein Leash. Klein Leash is one of my favorite scotches that I've never been to the distillery. And now that I know that they've been working on Bora, I would love to get a good look at it and look, look at what they're doing. You know. Bora is reopening in the next couple of weeks here, from what I understand. So yeah. hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get to go when the lockdowns end and we can get over there together. Um, Rosalind, how about you? Oh, well, I was I was going to say Isla as well. I've booked to go um, for the podcast to speak to some people and and Brora. I'd love to see Brora too, but I'd love to get back out to up to Space Sides. Watching the spirit of Space Sides just makes you just wish you were there. And and I was you know obviously we, we thought we we're going to go and we're not. And yeah, um, just sort of the area. I just I just want to get out of Glasgow basically, <laughs> get to the countryside and and get to get some good whiskey. And uh, I think the dog has come back into the house. So uh, <laughs> I, I got to admit, personally, right now, I would go to the first distillery I can get my hands on within driving range, just to, just to get back and smell the smells. Because that's the one thing I've one of the things I've missed is just uh, the smells of opening of a warehouse, the smells of the mash. Uh, even the CO2 in the fermenter. I, I wouldn't mind sticking my nose into a fermenter full stream and to get a good whiff of CO2 and just to get those, scent, those smells back because that's just one of those things that uh, you, never, you, just, you just miss. Um, Graham Frazier wants to know, what's the first whiskey you're going to drink when you visit your first bar or pub after lockdown? I want to depend. <laughs> Depends on what they got. <laughs> it depends on which bar it is, too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Moa? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, I mean, it depends what they have. I'll probably go for something that I haven't been able to get a hold of during lockdown. 
something interesting or I don't know. I mean, I've run out of Ardbeg, so I might just go for an Ardbeg 10. <laughs> Hopefully somebody from Ardbeg is listening and they can take care of that for you, Mara. <laughs> Rosalind? Yeah, see, I would probably, because I've said it earlier and now I really fancy it, probably 20 year old Glen Goyne if they had it. <laughs> I very rarely ever actually order whiskey in bars just because, one, bar prices are outrageous. And two, I've got more whiskey here than I can drink. I don't need to drink whiskey in bars unless I'm traveling. Usually when I go to a bar, it's for a beer. Uh, Bill Ricker says he's going to make a sales call on his best bartender. He wants to taste the 1960 Armagnac that Bill sold him, that, he's, that he sold the guy. So, And uh, well, Kurt, I know you have to run. It's the top of the hour, but favorite whiskey cocktail before you go? I'm trying to think probably Boulevardier at this point. It always switches. You know, summer when I'm lazy, it's a highball because I can just take a whiskey I like, a little bit of soda, Nice, nice hunk of ice, and I'm done. But you know, for right now, it's a Boulevardier. You know, and I'm going to New Orleans to... tomorrow, so we'll see. New Orleans, be safe. Uh, wear the mask and everything. Okay, we'll do. All right. And uh, Kurt Maitland is the author of in the Infused Cocktail Handbook and Drink, the Ultimate Cocktail Book. It's good and thick. There's recipes for almost everything in here. I've looked through here, and there's a bunch of stuff. I need to figure out how to make simple syrups and all that fun stuff so I can make some of these cocktails. Kurt, thank you. Safe travels. Uh, tell everyone in New Orleans we said hello, and I will uh, see you hopefully very soon, my friend. I hope so. So nice, nice seeing you guys, and I hope you guys have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. I know Kurt has said he had to leave us at the top of the hour. And, yes, Tabitha, you need that book. Uh, so, yes, you need that book. Uh, David Owen says he's not a guest, but when he gets back in a pub, it's going to be a pint of Murphy's Irish Red and a yellow spot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to admit, um, one of the local liquor stores, the off-license, just a few blocks n near here over in the next town over, is now carrying Sullivan's, two different types of Sullivan's beers from Kilkenny from their craft brewery. And I have been keeping those on stock in the house, the red ale and their golden ale. Uh, Graham Frazier, I was the only person at Clint Turret on Monday for their reopening, so he got a personalized tour, and it was great. We're making inside the cask <laughs> thirsty. Sorry about that. Good question here do, from Whiskey Connect. Do people consider international independent bottlers who bottle scotch whiskey to be on the world whiskey spectrum? I've had some good scotch by labels based in Italy and Germany, for example. I would say no. They're scotch whiskey blenders or scotch whiskey bottlers. I mean, look at Blackadder. Um, Robin is based in, uh, I think, Denmark and does some really good stuff. But uh, I would say no. What Any thoughts on that, on the independents out there? I, I would agree. If it's Scotch whiskey, I would probably just categorize it as Scotch whiskey, uh, even though there might be an international um, retailer or an independent bottler, sorry. But it's, I, I feel like where I am, I don't see a lot of the international independent bottlers. So I tend to see them once. They're more in the UK since that's what's local. Um but yeah, no, that's my opinion anyways um, for it. Rosalind? Yeah, no, I always agree. I, I agree completely. It's, yeah. And uh, I forgot to ask you two, because we asked Kurt before he left, uh, favorite whiskey cocktail before we, uh, before we call it a night here. I don't want to forget that for you two. <laughs> Well, I, so I, I love a highball as well for the same reason, but I had something recently at a, um, a tasting called, it was called a Rofignac or something, and it was um, whiskey with a tiny bit of cider vinegar and like a pomegranate syrup mixed with ginger beer, which is a take on like a really old cocktail. I'm, someone correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not an expert in this, but it, yeah, it was like, a, I think it's like a, they were talking to us about a shrub and this was what this was, you know, this, this syrup, the kind of, um, cider and syrup together with the whiskey and the ginger beer. It was very nice. And I have the recipe somewhere and I need to get it online because it was really good. Was that a hard ginger beer or a soft ginger beer? Or do you know? 
Um, what do, it was, what do you mean by hard or soft injury? Well, how, alcoholic versus non-alcoholic. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> um, it was non-alcoholic, yeah. So it was just okay. the whiskey was alcohol, yeah. That sounds lovely. Yeah, no? it was really good, yeah. Um, I, I like highball as well, but I would probably say I'll, I'll go for a penicillin or a mint julep uh, are probably my go-tos. And Chris Ratcliffe, question, uh, does everyone do the bar back bar scan when you first walk into a bar, looking for something on your to-drink list or an old favorite? What do you do when you walk into a whiskey bar for the first time? Do you look at that back bar and look for the stuff you haven't tasted? Probably. Um, well, if it's a completely new place, I will just have a quick look at what they have. And then depending on if I'm in the mood for maybe a cocktail instead, I'll just have a look on that menu. But if there is something, I mean, if you're going into a whiskey bar, being someone who's quite passionate about whiskey, I will have a look and see if there's anything I haven't tried before. And then I will have a look at the price for it uh, to see if it's worth it. Yeah, I, yeah, I always scan the bar and think, oh, what have I not tried? <laughs> yeah, because that's what that's the only way I'll buy whiskey in a bar is if um if it's something I haven't tried is it because generally I want to try I'll try something local I want to try like a local craft beer or something like that unless I'm traveling on somebody else's dime and they're buying and they want me to drink their whiskey of course I'll drink their whiskey but uh, let me ask the two of you uh, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you on a press trip? Oh, that's a good question. Feels like press trip. What are they? <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, the craziest thing. I've see. I've asked other people this, and I know other people's stories. So now I'm trying to think of anything that crazy has actually happened to me. Um. I mean, I've not been doing this for a long time, and half of it almost has been lockdown. So, I don't know. Um. Oh, I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah, nothing you'll, get too bad. The, you'll get into the debauchery at some point here at some point soon. I'm looking forward to creating some memorable experiences soon. <laughs> or not so memorable if you end yeah. up thinking too much. Yeah. <laughs> or at least deniable. <laughs> yeah. So, Rosalind, have you figured out what happened to you yet? or? No, well, no, just, I mean, there's been people being very drunk, but that's just kind of par for the course. There's not, I can't, nothing yeah. really stands out as being absolutely shocking. Um, no, I, I just, just a lot of drunk people, which is always fun. <laughs> well, I have something that happened on a whiskey trip or a distillery sure. trip. I mean, the first time I went up to Speyside, I got appendicitis and had to go into Elgin in the middle of the night to get morphine. <laughs> Uh, and then ended up in the hospital for a week. So that was memorable, I guess. <laughs> okay, yeah. that sort of works. <laughs> yeah. that, the, the only thing I've had that was even remotely unusual was just uh, in Ireland one time, the hotel, they sort of left us at the bar by ourselves, which was not a good thing. <laughs> um, That's and a weird we trust. started. <laughs> Well, yeah, they trusted us. Well, they said, don't mess with the tap for the Guinness pints. Of course, we started pulling Guinness pints. <laughs> and then they came back and said, we told you not to do that. You guys can't hang out in here anymore. But by the time we pulled something like 15 pints of Guinness for the pulled rounds and all that. Uh, Whiskey Canuck, I think there's a cocktail called appendicitis. Uh, <laughs> I wish that's what I got in Space Aid. Yeah. <laughs> And Bill says, not only do I back bar scan, I'll ask the barkeep if they have an old Dusty not on the menu. Remnants of father of the bride's personal bottles are sometimes talked to what tucked away. Yeah, that's clever. That's clever. And just Peter says, yeah. What about wow experiences? Chris Ratcliffe wants to know with press trips. Have things happened which have amazed you or people you've met? I think the so this this didn't happen to me unfortunately, but my colleague uh, Sean he got taken in a helicopter up to the McAllen before it opened, and you know so from Glasgow to Space Side it was no time at all, and um, the, obviously the McAllen Visitor Centre was completely and utterly at that time. Well, it's still amazing now, but it was completely wow. Um, 
So unfortunately that didn't happen to me, but he took, he took loads of videos and told us all about it. Um, but yeah, that sounded amazing. I'm trying to think. My, yeah, I'll, I'll have a think if there's anything amazing that's happened to me. People, people are always lovely. Like, I've always found people to be, it's ne I really enjoy meeting new people in those situations. Don't, you know, you can think it could be quite daunting going on your own to like another part of the world or, you know, part of the country you're not sure of with people you don't know. But I've always found it to be really interesting and people are always, you know, really easy to talk to and you meet new people and, you know, talking to them about their experiences. And it's, you know, whether or not they're in the industry and, and journalism or whether, you know, they're um, bloggers or influencers, it's just, it's nice to meet such different people all the time, which has yeah. been missing a lot for the last year. <laughs> No. Yeah, no, I mean, I've always met really lovely people. I'm not sure if I have one of those like helicopter moments, but I mean, sometimes it's just worth like walking into a warehouse or just seeing where the distillery is located can feel like such a wow moment. Just feeling like you have a job where that's part of it. And I know that might sound super cheesy, but I'd probably say like things like that can just wow me. Yeah, uh, on that note, um, about four or five years ago, I was on a uh, Lagavulin press trip on Isla. We were at the uh, Port Charlotte Hotel and having di getting ready for dinner. And I just finished recording an interview with Georgie Crawford. And a young guy came up afterwards and said, are you Mark Gillespie? And I said, yes. He goes, I recognize your voice. I listened to the show. I'm visiting the island with my father-in-law. And... Uh, can we get a picture with you? And that just completely came out of the blue. And I thought that was, that was one of the really cool things that happened. Uh, Robin Cooper on those crazy things, Chris Morris slipped in the bathtub and cracked his head open at Glen Morangy house. Fortunately, he was okay. Um, and Chris was the, uh, is the master distiller at Woodford reserve. Actually, I can give you one of the crazy, the, I can top the crazy thing. This was in Louisville, Kentucky at a Heaven Hill trip for Parker Beam's 50th anniversary celebration. We ha Heaven Hill had set up a hospitality suite at the hotel for us where we were all staying. And we were trying to, I was trying to open a bottle of bottled water and we didn't have a bottle opener. We didn't have a pry top thing in the room. I went into the bathroom tried to pry it open with the faucet handle. The bottle slipped. <clears throat> I hit the uh, ceramic sink and it shattered. And that was the weirdest thing that ever happened. And Heaven Hill said, don't worry about it. It happens. We should have had a bottle opener in the room. But uh, let's see. And as... Uh, Chris Ratcliffe points out the Port Charlotte Hotel, the maker of Isla's second best pudding, Pete Head, the Port Charlotte Hotel, his favorite whiskey bar. So one final question for you. Where do you want to be sipping a whiskey a year from now? When we're through this, hopefully, where do you want to be sipping a whiskey this time, first of May next year? Well... I mean, ideally on a beach somewhere, but <laughs> they're probably more than likely up in Speyside. Lovely. Possibly on the beach there by the Spey, you know, down by the bridge. Yeah, that'd Mom? be nice. I mean, I just want to see my family. I haven't seen them for over a year. So hopefully I'm celebrating Well Pergis Night with my dad having a dram outside, maybe having a barbecue and sitting by the fire. That would be so nice. <laughs> And that's right. You told me you before we started that your dad got really excited when you got into whiskey, right? Yeah, he he's a big fan. He has this little wooden bar that his friend has made him. He loves Lagavulin and the Sillers edition. And he every time I'm home, he just wants to show off his bar. So I will be in my old bedroom and you'll see through the door. There'll be like a little glass coming in. It's like, try this one. And then it's like, oh, try this one. And I'm like, He's so excited. It's so sweet. I would really want to take it to the distillery one day because uh, we've never been together to one. That nice. will be fun. So 
With that, we have uh, killed 75 minutes that none of us will ever get back. And I want to thank our guests, Kurt Madeland, who left earlier tonight, along with Moa Nilsson, the Swedish whiskey girl, and Rosalind Erskine, the food and drinks writer for The Scotsman. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Uh, great conversation. really enjoyed it. And I uh, want to have you both back on the show. And I cannot wait until... Uh, Hopefully we can get a drink together over in Scotland at some point in the near future. So thank you again. Thank you very Thanks much. For having us. <laughs> and with that, thank you again for watching tonight. Don't forget we'll have the uh, podcast up this weekend and another episode of the Happy Hour Live webcast next Friday night, 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. UK time, 2100 GMT. Until we meet again, I'm Mark Gillespie. Stay safe, wear your masks, and take good care of each other. Slanchava, good night.